All right, good morning, everybody, and I uh, hope you're off to a good start on Monday. I'm going to see if I can get after some of these questions uh, that came in. And my goal was to do this uh, in one take. I'm not going to try to be fancy or smooth on this. Just want to get after the questions. So a few questions coming in, and I'm going to read the question and do my best to answer them. And uh, so here's the first question from yesterday's sermon. Do you interpret the Bible in terms of dispensationalism or of covenant theology, or are both systems inadequate? All right, so if you are familiar with the terms dispensationalism and covenant theology, then you know what that question is about. And if you don't know what those terms are about, then this question probably isn't for you at all. Really quickly, because uh, you could, one could, there are whole books written on this. But both dispensationalism and covenant theology are ways of putting together the whole story of the Bible. So I think that's why this question is being asked. So in our sermon series, we're trying to put together the story of the Bible. And so dispensationalism looks at uh, specific dispensations throughout the Bible's chronology and timeline. And so uh, dispensationalists maybe disagree about how many different dispensations there are, but seven is a pretty typical number for dispensationalists. And the idea is that during each dispensation or timeline or kind of epoch or chapter of the Bible's overall story, that God deals differently with uh, his people in different, you know, in different or unique ways. And so you kind of have to know which dispensation you're in to know how God is dealing with his people. And so that's the idea of dispensationalism. Covenant theology is a way of putting together the story of the Bible around the idea of covenants and primarily two covenants uh, three covenants um, is uh, also common but the idea is that there's a covenant of works that uh, is really the initial covenant between God and Adam and then there's the covenant of grace that because the covenant of works failed uh, and Adam uh, and Eve did not uh, meet up properly to the standards of the covenant of works, then God introduced the second covenant, the covenant of grace. And of course, God knew in advance that the covenant of works would fail, and so there would be a need for covenant of grace. And then the third covenant is a covenant of redemption, and the idea of that is that um, uh, the Father and the Son made a covenant uh, before all of this started that the Son would provide redemption for humanity when humanity failed the first covenant. So both dispensationalism and covenant theology are trying to put together uh, a meta-narrative, as it were, that explains the overall story of the Bible. And uh, I grew up in a dispensational uh, context, and uh, I would just say that I'm not a dispensationalist present. That wouldn't be the way that I would uh, define myself theologically. I wouldn't say, though, that I'm a covenant uh, theologian either. I think both of them have contributions to make. I think the thing that's to be said in favor of both of them is that they are trying to put together a way of reading the entire story of the Bible. And I think that's, that's really helpful. And it's what we're trying to do uh, even with this sermon series is being able to make sense of how the whole Bible fits together. The way that I tend to think about these sort of things uh, is that there is a single covenant that God has made that's reflected in his relationship with Adam and Eve, the first human beings. And that covenant did, in fact, uh, fail. Human beings did not uh, keep the covenant, and it broke. And what the story of the Bible uh, is about is God repairing humanity into that original covenant. So the kind of subsequent covenants that come, whether it be the Mosaic covenant, the, the law, or whether it would be the Noahic covenant, which is another covenant that's made, we read about, or the Davidic covenant, or the Abrahamic covenant, that all of these are sort of covenants within the larger covenant, and that God uh, is using these uh, kind of sub-covenants, as it were, to reestablish the one great covenant that he has with human beings. And so God's in original intent, his uh, founding purpose is to create the world, create his image. Adam and Eve are appointed as the, uh, the vice regents or the king and queens of the world, the priest kings and queens of the world. And then when that breaks and Satan steps in and kind of uh, dismantles all of that and assumes the world throne, that God is now is looking to return humanity and creation back to his original 
uh, intention. And so that's what the story of the Bible is all about. So dispensationalism and covenant theology, I think, uh, arguably can kind of get after some of that, but I think they're, they're not quite focused on those things. So, uh, so to that question, I think both can be helpful, and I think both don't quite get after the way that uh, I've been approaching this uh, story of the Bible. All right, second question. Uh, if Malachi means messenger, who was the writer of the book of Malachi? And the answer is, I don't know. And the answer is, I don't think anyone knows. We don't know who the, the writer of the book of Malachi is. Most of the prophetic books are named after the prophet that wrote them. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. There's a few, like for instance, Lamentations was written by the prophet Jeremiah, but it is a, the, the title is a descriptor of uh, what the book is about. It's about the lamentations of the nation of Israel during their time of captivity. Well, the book of Malachi is similar, right? It's not named after the prophet that wrote it. It's named about what the book is about. It's named about this messenger that will come in anticipation of the great day of the Lord. So we don't know who wrote uh, the book of Malachi. God knows, uh, but we don't know. All right. Um, Here's another one. What is the third day that you were talking about at the start? So if you remember, I, I said that Christmas and Easter are the two highest holiest days of the year and that all of our salvation hangs upon uh, these two days. But then I said uh, provocatively and to, uh, to forecast for the future that there's a third day that is the culmination and the fulfillment of Christmas and Easter, and that actually is the greatest day uh, that Christians look forward to. But it hasn't happened yet in our timeline, and so I said we're going to get to it next year. Well, it hasn't happened yet uh, in where we're at in telling the story of the Bible, and it also hasn't happened yet in history. And so I'm going to leave it as a bit of a tease uh, for uh, until we get to next year, because we're going to end the story of the Bible on that great day. And that great day is uh, the climax, truly, uh, of the covenant. So talking about uh, in my last question about how, or that first question about how there's a single covenant that God has made with humanity, and he's all about been restoring this covenant. And we get to this last day. It's the final restoration of this covenant that God has made originally with humanity. And so we'll get to that uh, next year. All right. Um, here's another one. Does the phrase day of the Lord refer to the first advent anticipated by the Israelites or the second advent that we are anticipating now or both? And then there's a second part to this question also regarding judgment and rewards that are coming on that day, something that happens I'm not sure. Let's see. Also, are the judgments and rewards that are coming on that day something that happens immediately or are they future to Jesus' second coming? All right, so two parts to this question. All right, so the day of the Lord, that's a common uh, expression, particularly in the Old Testament and in the prophets. So the, the prophets will speak about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And uh, the day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord, is this day when God comes and he puts everything right. He straightens everything out. And uh, so it's this future time uh, when the Lord will come. And in many ways, uh, in Malachi's prophecy that we looked at uh, this uh, past Sunday, Malachi is speaking about this day of the Lord that is coming, right? And so he's anticipating this day that's coming. It's prophesied uh, that's going to come, and that's when the messenger is going to come and prepare people for this day. And so the day of the Lord would have been understood in the old uh, Testament context as this final great eschatological day when Israel is redeemed and restored and uh, all is made right and true. So they would not have been thinking about two separate comings of Messiah, like one coming when Jesus came and then a second coming uh, down the road, what we refer to as uh, the second coming. They would have been th seeing this, a single coming of Messiah. And so uh, they wouldn't have seen two separate days of the Lord. And there really aren't, to be precise, there's not two separate days of the Lord. 
uh, there is a single day of the Lord, and Christ's first coming is the sort of the, um, it's the foot in the door of this coming of the Lord that's going when he, when he fully enters into the space of creation, right? So uh, Christ comes, and that inaugurates the day of the Lord, but the day of the Lord hasn't reached its consummation until Christ comes again. So, um, so the phrase day of the Lord would have been understood by the Israelites. They would have had in mind more probably what we as Christians think of with the second coming, this kind of great cataclysmic day of the Lord that we might read about, for instance, in the book of Revelation. Then the second part of that question was, are the judgments and rewards that are coming on that day something that happens immediately or are they future to Jesus' second coming? Mostly, I think, related to the future. Uh, we talked, uh, if you recall, from our um, politics sermon series about the kind of the, the way that baptism helps us understand the Christian life. We die with Christ and we rise with Christ. And there's a sense in which our dying and rising with Christ is worked out through the course of this life. But the full rising with Christ doesn't, and then all the rewards and the blessings and the freedom and the power, like all that comes with the rising with Christ, which would be kind of the rewards aspect of the Christian life, those don't take their full effect really until the resurrection that happens in the day of the Lord at the end of all time, the great general resurrection of the dead. And so there is a, there's a sense in which we have to wait, and we, this is what the life of faith is about. The life of faith is anticipating, waiting for, kind of dying now, as it were, but dying now in hopes of this great day of the Lord where we will be rewarded, uh, where we get the rising with Christ that comes uh, as the second half of the dying with Christ, that baptismal uh, metaphor. Okay. Uh, Here's another question. Why in John 1 21 did John the Baptist say that he was not Elijah when he clearly knew he was the prophesied messenger? Was it from not understanding the first and second comings of Christ? Okay, this question uh, is tricky and let me see if I can make sense of it. I had, to, I had to kind of get my ducks in a row a little bit before I tried to take a stab at this one. Okay, so what the question is referring to is in John 1 21. And let me just read this here because probably all of you do not have John 1 21 memorized. But John 1 21, uh, Elijah or John the Baptist is asked who he is. So he comes, he's preaching in the wilderness, he's baptizing people and he's asked, who are you? Right? Like what, what, what's your, what are you about? And, um, so, so the Jews, uh, the religious leaders, sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed, here we read verse 20, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And then they asked him, Well, what then? Are you Elijah? Because if you're not the Christ that's to come, then maybe you're the Elijah that's to come that precedes the Christ that's to come. And he said, I am not. Are you the and then they said to him, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said, said to him, who are you then? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah has said. Okay. Okay, I don't know that I've got a great answer for this question, but I'm going to see if I can put this together. So Jesus says in Matthew 11 that John the Baptist is the Elijah that is to come. And John, in John chapter 1, says he's not the Elijah that is to come. All right, so how do, we, how do we figure this out? Well, generally, if you have to choose between John and Jesus, go with Jesus. But that doesn't really solve our problem. So John is quoting from Isaiah 40. So Isaiah 40 says, uh, the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Malachi in chapter 3, which we looked at yesterday, it picks up Isaiah's prophecy and refers to one who comes to prepare the way of the Lord and then refers to this one who is to come as Elijah. So Malachi is building off of Isaiah's earlier prophecy. 
So Isaiah is kind of the, the headwater or the fount of this idea that someone will come and prepare the way of the Lord. And this someone will be a voice crying in the wilderness. Malachi grabs that, speaks of a messenger who will come, who will prepare the way of the Lord, refers to him as Elijah, and then we're on into the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, you've got two different gospel traditions. You've got the synoptic gospel tradition, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're kind of all lumped together because if you've read the gospels, they share a lot of the same material. They tell a lot of the same stories. They have a lot of the same exact language. They're clearly drawing either from each other or they're drawing from a common source that we uh, no longer have, but they're borrowing a lot of the same material. And then you have the gospel of John, which is the Johannine, tr Johannine tradition. And John's gospel is very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he tells a lot of stories that aren't told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He has a lot of teachings that aren't in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So they're very, very different. So in the synoptic tradition of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they seem to be reading, or they are reading, John the Baptist through the lens of Malachi, where Malachi connects Isaiah to Elijah, who is to come. But John's gospel is connecting John the Baptist straight back to Isaiah 40. Skips past Malachi's kind of addition and just goes straight back to Isaiah 40. So you've got the synoptic gospels thinking of and talking about John the Baptist through the lens of Isaiah and Malachi. And you have John's gospel just talking about John the Baptist through the lens of Isaiah 40. Okay, so it doesn't really quite answer our question yet. So why does this happen? Okay, so let me jump over uh, to, I think we're gonna go to Matthew 17. So Matthew 17 is the transfiguration. And in Matthew 17, Jesus again speaks of John the Baptist as Elijah. All right, so he's up on the mountain, he's transfigured. Moses and Elijah show up in the midst of this transfiguration and they talk with Jesus for a while and then they're gone and then Peter, James, and John who had gone up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, they're like, hey, why does the scripture say that Elijah has to come first? Because they've just seen Elijah and they're like, what, what is that about? And um, Jesus says this, okay, so this is Matthew 17, 11. He says, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, uh, spoiler alert, he eventually gets beheaded. And so what's interesting here in this passage is that jesus seems to be suggesting it's a little oblique but he seems to be suggesting that there are two comings of elijah he says elijah will come like in the future he will still come and he will restore all things but he in he has already come and his first coming is in john the baptist so that's a little vague too, exactly what is being referred to there. But the way that I would read that is that uh, Jesus is saying, if we go back to this day of the Lord idea, that the day of the Lord begins with the coming of Jesus and it's consummated fully with the second coming of Jesus. That's the whole day of the Lord, right? And Elijah shows up in anticipation of the beginning of the day of the Lord, and that coming is John the Baptist. His coming is the coming of Elijah, kind of typologically and symbolically. But yet there's this still greater coming when Jesus comes in the day of the Lord, at the consummation of the day of the Lord, and Elijah is yet to come in anticipation of that day as well. So, what I take John to be saying is John saying, I'm not the full Elijah. I'm not the, the, the full fulfillment of Elijah. But Jesus, maybe in a, in a movie, it's like, well, that's a little too humble, John, because you are the Elijah, 
right? You are the Elijah that is to come, that is preparing the way of the Lord, because Christ's coming is the coming of the day of the Lord, because he is the Lord that comes on the great day. So I think how I put these together uh, in order to make sense of Jesus and John's statements about who the Elijah is, is that uh, they're both right, and that uh, John the Baptist is the Elijah that comes at the beginning of the day of the Lord, but yet there's this greater fulfillment of the true Elijah, uh, and some scholars speculate it's actually Elijah himself to recall that Elijah did not die uh, in the Old Testament. So uh, in Revelation 11, there's this prophecy given, uh, and some take as a prophecy, some do not, but this prophecy given of two witnesses that will come and the power of these witnesses will be the capacity to uh, make it not rain, which is something that Elijah did. And so um, is Elijah one of these two witnesses that he comes before the great and final day of the Lord? I don't know. You know that, that's one of the ideas. All right. So the idea here is that Jesus is, um, or the summation of this, is that John the Baptist is the Elijah that comes as the day of the Lord inaugurates, but then there's this greater fulfillment of this Elijah promise that comes when the day of the Lord reaches, reaches its consummation. Okay, well, I hope that made sense to the person that asked it, even if it didn't make sense uh, to the rest of you. So, all right, those, oh wait, I had one more question that came in. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, why the reference to Elijah and not a specific reference to Messiah? I'm not sure I understand that question because maybe that question is asking why did I only mention Elijah and not reference Messiah or is that why did the Bible I think the question probably is in the okay this is how I'm going to take that question in uh, Malachi's prophecy it's named the messenger right and the focus is on the messenger who is to come the messenger who is to come comes in anticipation of the Lord the Lord's coming. Now, reading Malachi, you wouldn't necessarily read it and be like, that's a reference to Messiah. It's a reference to the Lord's coming, not Messiah's coming. But I think what's going on there that's insightful, or at least ordained by God and how these prophecies came together, is that the Lord's coming and the Messiah's coming are the same coming. That's the same thing. So in the uh, Old Testament mindset, there was this view that Messiah would come and he would uh, prepare, as it were, he would create or he would bring about the day of the Lord. And that's true. But they would have not thought of Messiah as the Lord himself that is celebrated in the day of the Lord. They would have seen the Messiah and the day of the Lord, at the Lord as something different. So I think what Malachi is doing is he is collapsing Messiah into the Lord so that when the messenger comes, and I think this is the kind of the beauty of Malachi's prophecy, is that when the messenger comes, John, John the Baptist, and he proclaims, he's the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, that then what we have is, well, then who's the Lord? Who has come? If, if John is now proclaiming that the Lord has come, who is the Lord? Well, Jesus is the Lord that has come. And that was the unexpected move that God made that was not anticipated. They were expecting something different to happen when the Lord showed up. But the Lord showed up in the person of Jesus, born into all that we celebrate here on Christmas, born into the humble beginnings of this poor Jewish family, and grows up in, in uh, Nazareth, uh, in Galilee, where no one is expecting uh, the Messiah to come from. And so the Lord shows up in these humble circumstances. Uh, and um, Malachi's prophecy, by connecting the messenger to the Lord, is connecting, I think, ultimately the Lord to Jesus. So, okay, well, that's what I got. This is fun. I don't know if it's fun for you, uh, but it's my kind of fun. So uh, thank you for sending in your questions. And... Um, We'll go after it again uh, next week. So have a great rest of the week, and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.